just to introduce uh, what people, how people perceive the fourth industrial re revolution. Let me now hand over to Ora Kawanza Rua, who you've seen speak on the video, but I think today when she comes up here, she will speak specifically to today, today's event, which is on agri-tech, being an agro-based uh, economy and many agro-based economies across Africa. I think this is particularly pertinent to find out how uh, this fourth industrial revolution can help us uh, improve yields, improve agriculture, become more food secure amongst many others. And I think that will be the focus of the discussion once we get into the panel discussion and debate today. And we encourage you to participate. Those who are watching online, please uh, get in touch with us. Uh, tweet, tag, like, comment, and we'll be taking a lot of those uh, comments and contributions uh, later in this uh, event. For now, let me hand over uh, to Ora. Please put your hands together. Good morning. Good morning. Doesn't, it's, I feel like three people responded to me. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you so much. I am so excited. I, I actually can't stop smiling. I'm really excited. And I'm so happy that we managed to cross over and do our next, our second event. This is our second event as Afri Digital. Um, starting something is always really, really difficult, but um, with our super awesome partners, um, if possible and here everyone is today. So let me not waste your time and get straight into my welcome note. A friend of mine and a conscious intellect by the name of Cynthia Marangwanda shared an interesting post on Facebook about two weeks ago. It read, according to the African Development Bank, Africa contains 65% of the world's most arable uncultivated land. But it imports over $35 billion in food a year. So we have 65% of the world's most arable, uncultivated land, but we import over $35 billion in food a year. The original article referenced in her post went on to say that that's a figure that could rise to $110 billion by 2025 if current trade trends continue. The first question for me that came to mind is what is wrong with our agriculture sector? Why are we not maximizing our resources and reaching our full potential? In the EU Commission 2017 paper on Industry 4.0 in agriculture with a focus on IoT aspects, the digitization of agriculture is referred to as Agriculture 4.0. The paper reads, beyond the introduction of new tools and practices, the real promise of Agriculture 4.0 in terms of productivity increase resides in the ability to remotely collect, use, and exchange data, states the paper. As a country, we are in dire need of an upgrade. We need to take ownership of and customize the technological developments that have been ushered in by the fourth industrial revolution because it's only with new solutions that we can solve old problems. There is no way that one discussion like the one we're going to have this morning will transform an entire sector. However, there is power in dialogue towards achieving an upgraded agricultural sector and an upgraded economy. The purpose of this series of Afri Digital Public Lectures is to encourage a, renew a renewed learning and collaborative culture amongst industries. Technology is developing incredibly fast and it is only through continuous dialogue and education on digital innovations that we can hope to keep up with the future of work. This event is made possible by our, gener and our, by our generous and incredibly supportive partners, ZFM Stereo and the, and the entire AB Communications Group, Nande Mutande, our connectivity and lead digital partner, Adipo, our intellectual property and lead multi-sector partner, Drone Solutions, Metric Design and Build Consult, Anderson Decor, and Tracy Mason Media. My favorite quote is that it takes a village to raise a child. And so our team is deeply grateful to our village of partners. I would personally like to dedicate this lecture to Ms. Gurley Makwanya, our research and data analyst who was not able to join us today and in the run-up of this event, as she's attending to her child who has been incredibly unwell. It is for our children that we shift our focus to the future, and so we continue to lay the foundations for their better tomorrow. 
And so it is with these few words that I would like to welcome you all, uh, including you, our online viewers, I see you, uh, to the second Afri Digital Public Lecture on the Agri Tech Talk. Thank you very much, Ora, for those uh, words of welcome and I think some posing some interesting statistics and facts which I think will uh, put this discussion into its proper context and I'm sure has already got people thinking and uh, wondering and um, preparing to engage in discussion. Before we get to that, we've got a speaker from Aripo. I did mention earlier that they are uh, a very important and crucial partner for us, the African Regional Intellectual Property Organization. Please put your hands together for Mr. Flora Mpanju. She's the head of search and substantive examination at Aripo. Uh, thank you so much, ma'am. Please may you come forward. Sorry, I'll need, just need to move the photo on this side. The laptop is connected to the... Sorry. First, the world is becoming more prosperous. Over 1 billion people have been lifted out of poverty in the last 20 years. Three factors. The factor of technology, the factor of norms, that is, legislation, and also the society. We know a lot about the biotechnologies, about the nanotechnologies. We know a, a lot about the human genome. And of course, uh, we need to take into account the media power that would definitely stand behind the behavior of the society. The role of communication in organizing the masses. Vamos a ver la consolidación de la conciencia social acerca de la protección del medio ambiente. Taking massive amounts of time. Artificial intelligence taking massive amounts of time. Ladies and gentlemen, we have been in Zimbabwe since 1980. When we gained independence, we started from Nairobi, then we moved to, to, to Arare, and this is our headquarters. And when we started, we were dealing with industrial property. Don't you worry about it, we know it. Then, in 2002, we added more mandate on us, now we are intellectual property. Don't you worry about it, you are going to know it. Well, this is our member state, 19 member states, and the Zimbabwe being a reporter. Can't you clap for yourself, guys? Yeah. <laughs> okay. 19 member states, mostly from east, west, south, but in South Africa is not a member, and Nigeria is not a member. And we have got another sister organization, which is in Yaoundé, Cameroon, for French-speaking country. And also, we have got 17 member states. What we have 19 member states. Who is it going back? 
Okay. We call it industrial design, but it is design. You go to buy things because of their design. You buy shoes because of their uh, design. You buy cars because of their design. You buy suits because of their design. Watch and everything. Those we call it industrial design. There is trade secret. Trade secret. As long as it is secret, you can you can protect it. For example, Coca Cola. He decided not to di to disclose the the formula. He kept his a secret. Pepsi Cola tried and he ended up with Pepsi. With Pepsi. Oh, the, the, the client's list, if you are doing business, you can't tell everyone that this is my client, you just tell me. So it is the trade secret. Okay, there is a geographical indication. Geographical indication, there are goods which deal to a certain environment in a certain, a certain soil, there is a characteristic which makes those goods to taste different from others. For example, Mazoe, Mazoe, I don't think if you take those uh, oranges from Mazoe and you take them somewhere else, they will test the way they test. Is it so? So those ones, there are things which we are supposed to look at, they are tangible, they are tangible things, which as a, as a country or as a government, we have to use them to get money. And I'm sure there are so many goods which are peculiar, maybe deadly for Zimbabwe. There is this champagne, champagne, long time ago, everyone, would, whatever I do, would say this is a champagne. But it went to the extent of saying, no, Champagne is one village in, in France. Those, those grapes which grow there, they have got a certain characteristic which you can't get it anyway. So it is peculiar. You can't grow anything and call it Champagne. You will be in trouble if you take it to court. So I think there are so many things we have discovered, but there are so many things which we can use as Africa to make money out of them. Now, you can protect the item using all the, you can use the trademark, design, copyright, whatever. So it's not using one item at all. You can use all these gadgets for, for protecting your product. For example, Coca-Cola, the bottle you see there, the design of the bottle is protected. The drink inside is protected under trade secret. The, the, the shape itself is designed and then Coca-Cola is the trademark, and then they go to the extra to put in C, C copyright. Copyright, you trade for everything. Well, now, let us go to the new plant variety protection. This is a, a, a certain kind of protection which will protect our plant, and it, it is, should be new, not every plant or any seed you can protect. It should be new, by the way. And this thing, different from others, and it can be uniform. When you grow it, it will be uniform. For example, you see this rice here is a new variety. Those beans there, it is a new variety. And the, the beans, the, the, the means there. New variety. I am not talking about the hybrid. I am talking from the natural seed, which when you grow them today, even if you, you don't grow them, them today, and the repeat next year, it is going to be the same. It's not in any hybrid. It is a new seed which we really need as Africans. <coughs> well, for us, as I said, we have got a protocol. We have got a protocol called the Arusha Protocol, which is for, 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 for our region. And we started working on it since two, it was 2010. And right now we have got a protocol, and we had a regulation already, and the one member state have already ratified. We expect a lot of people to ratify this, because this is the way you are going to get to see. Coming out with new variety, it takes time. People will be doing research for nine years. So there is no way without protection, these people will come to invest to us and get this, this, this variety. We have to put a mechanism so that people can come to Africa and invest it, knowing that it, they, they can't be, their product can't be in, in, in food. Well, we benefit from that because when they bring their seeds, we also, we are breeders, we use whatever we have, we come with a different variety. So having this system is very, very important for Africa because we also gain from that. And we are crying for food and what? This is the way to get it. Otherwise, if we don't put this in place, no one is coming to invest with us. Well, the ma so I urge the member states to, I encourage them to, to ratify the protocol. 
Well, there is uh, another uh, international organization called Union of Plant Variety, which Zimbabwe used to be a member. But uh, I don't know now if it is still a member. But Kenya is a member, and Kenya has been benefiting from this, Susan can tell us. They just imagine, in 2018, just for four months, they gained 400, 423 million out of Katipa. And the Kenya has been benefiting a lot, because these people, when they bring their variety, Kenyans also do breeding and come out with a very good variety. So if we want to go ahead, let us join this uh, Arusha protocol. So other IP pro pro protection in Africa, we can also use patent and utility models, as I said before, yeah, and to, to protect our technology. We can use industrial design, trademarks, trade secrets, copyright, for all goods from agriculture. So in order to get an IP right, you have to find a patent. You can't say that yeah, I have got a, 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 a patent without signing. <coughs> if you file, you can find natural, natural, meaning you are filing with a Zimbabwe Patent Office, or you can come regionally if you want a big market to a repo, or you can go international. This is the, the filing route, of, of course it will be boring you, but when you need to file, you will know it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, as I said, agriculture technology registered at a repo. When you go to WEDWA, of course, when we search for technology, they are divided into eight classes from A to H. Agriculture field is classified under A, A01G. <coughs> when you search WEDWA, you are going to get um, about 10,000 patent files in this field. So it is free. You, you can look at any technology, copy it if it is not protected here, and you continue. Yeah. When you come at a repo, you can, we can search into that, uh, our database to tell you what is protected in, in, in the, our member state. We have got uh, around 110 patents, and the six of them, uh, six utility model files in this field. So you can see. But what is very interesting, I want you to see other technology, because this is general technology, without the pesticide or what. Okay. These are different cl classes, which I'm going to explain why I, 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 I do this. From the classification above and in the, in the, the graph, there is 16 agriculture technology that are in line with the industrial four revolution, which can be utilized by researchers, farmers in our member states. And in some of them, they are not even protected. So, for so example, technology on the plant monitoring method. There are so many. So please, if you want any technology, you can come and search with your repo. We tell you, you go and do what you are doing. If you are a researcher or you are a farmer, if it's not protected in Zimbabwe, you can go ahead and copy the technology. So don't scratch your head. Everything is already there for you. It is you to set and to know and do business. Okay. So benefit of using a repo system, you get all the information you want. Don't reinvent the wheel because everything is already there for you. And it will help you to avoid infringement. In conclusion, IP tool for innovation development, it touches all broader society, it touches everywhere, agriculture, research, business, and everything. You see how important is this IP? Using a repo system, you can protect your invention and get information that you can improve your agriculture. Using current information <coughs> found in patents, patents, a repo patent, you will be able to compete with new technology of the industrial four revolution. Use new plant variety system with help farmers to get high yield in the produce and their pro product will benefit Africa to solve hunger. The Gam Africa government should put in place policies which link agriculture, market, and consumer to avoid producing a lot of food which can be end up in the waste. It's not just like the, okay, we are producing, but the system should be there. The government should be now. So that when the farmer is producing, at least he, he gets a market and go and sell things, not to produce and then invest the food. Africa will benefit much.
because of the big percentage in CSA, we have got a big yellow balloon. So if we get this technology, we are going to, in fact, we will be feeding the world if you are serious. However, a major challenge, which is created African industrial four, and in other Yabo, what do you think about this? Are we going to get there? We don't have, we want to automate the, the, the farms, and there's no electricity. Our robot is going to work. <coughs> so what do we do? of search and substantive examination at our report thought for working presentation we certainly left it on a note that is uh, very relevant given the current situation we face in Zimbabwe at this point in time. Uh, I think the results obviously need to look at this holistically, address other challenges that will enable uh, this fourth industrial revolution. So it needs to address and invest in all other infrastructure so that it becomes a reality, something that Africa needs to start doing now strategically, I suppose. Uh, for those who've been having difficulty accessing the Wi-Fi, uh, it is because I had uh, said Tande 2019 has all caps. It's actually small letter, so choose the Tande Tande option. Password is Utande 2019, one word and all small letters, Utande 2019. Uh, talking about Utande, let me now call upon the general manager of Utande, subsidiary of Tande Utande, Mr. Ignatius Mpandwe, and he'll be talking about the Internet of Things in agriculture. Please put your hands together for him. sharing ideas in terms of how do we improve the situation, how do we improve Zimbabwe and become a better place. This is the outline of uh, the presentation. What is IoT? What is smart farming? <coughs> Why smart farming? Smart farming use cases that I will share with you and why Land Mutande is a strategic fit. Internet of Things. Some of you might have heard about this word, but for those who are hearing it for the first time, IoT is simply an ecosystem of connected physical objects that are accessible through the internet. According to the Global Standard Institute 2015, it defines it as, it consists of network of physical objects, devices, vehicles, buildings and other items embedded with electronics, software sensors, and network connectivity. I like these definitions because they are not limited. They are not talking of agriculture here. They are not talking of cows. They are not talking of chickens, pigs. But who knows? Today they are now part of the networking. They are now part of the internet, which we are going to talk about. You find that IoT has been talked of Mostly, if you are to refer to the manufacturing industry, to the mining industry, aerospace, and the like. But today, we are going to talk about IoT and its application within the agriculture sector. You can forget about these long and complicated definitions, but please, bear in mind that it is the enabler of doing things smart. Just to visualize the IoT, you've got your wireless router at home, you've got your power, your smart meters, you've got your computing, you've got your car, you've got your hospital, and the like. Today, all this stuff is now connected with the use of IoT. But as you can see on this diagram, the farm is not anywhere. The cows is not anywhere on that picture. 
But today we are talking of agriculture, and we are talking about the farm being incorporated in that picture. Ladies and gentlemen, everything has gone smart. We talk of smartphones, we talk of smart TV, we talk of smart meters, we talk of smart cities, we talk of smart cars. Even in the corporate space, we talk of smart goals. But here I'm to share with you smart agriculture. Agriculture <coughs> is not an exception. We are not far off. We have tried something. I'm sure you can all agree that is smart. It might not be smart enough, but it's a first step to becoming smart. It's realizing that we have got a shortage of water, but we can maximize every drop of water that we are going to put in the ground. Although this is labor intensive, but it's a first step in becoming smart. Why the focus on agriculture? The economy performed better in 2018, and this is all attributed to agriculture. An important statistic, 65% of African labor force is engaged in agriculture. You might want to see it as a positive in the national employment statistic. But if you, look at, if you are to look at it differently, instead of employing 65% of the African labor force in the agriculture space, is there an opportunity to automate such that we can upskill those people who are working in the farms right now, such that they can be better employed in certain areas of the economy. Food for thought. It is also interesting to note that the projections for 2019 to grow by 4.2 and to grow by 4.4 in 2020, agriculture and mining are expected to be, to be the main drivers of that growth. Agriculture is also the cornerstone of us realizing the Vision 2030. I'm sure if all of us are aware of the Vision 2030, which is for Zimbabwe to become an upper middle income economy. Agriculture is the cornerstone of that. Like my previous colleague has indicated, we have a problem. The population is growing. And according to FAO, because of the growing population, there's a requirement for us to increase food production by 70% by 2050. Whether that statistic is correct or not, it's still debatable. But trust me, it could be plus or minus 15 to 20%. But the fact remains that there's pressure for us <coughs> to increase food production. You find that we are faced with a challenge to produce more with what we have. Producing more with less is equal to world of smart farming. What is smart farming? Smart farming is simply a farming management concept using modern technology to increase the quantity and quality of agriculture products. It's making farm more intelligent, connected through precision agriculture. To produce more with less, farmers must adopt technologies and practices that obtain more output from existing resources. And most importantly, smart farming focuses on a number of areas, which include embracing technology to production processes, seeding, fertilizer application, animal feeding, monitoring, weed and pest control, and numerous other methods to improve input or quality of output. I'm going to focus on two aspects of agriculture because IoT, the way how it has been applied in agriculture is very broad. But because of time, I'm going to focus on two aspects, which is animal husbandry and crop farming, specifically greenhouses. In the animal husbandry space, you find that we have got IoT gadgets, IoT sensors that are tagged to the animals. And if you are able to do that, 
This is what IoT can be able to give you in return. Is the identification of animals. Gone are the days when you can relate or identify the animals by their colors. I think it only depends with how many you have on your farm. Talk of a thousand cows on your farm. Will you be able to relate to them using colors? Not anymore. <laughs> Heat detection for improved conception rates. Because of the tag which is put on the animal and monitoring the movements of the animal, you'll be able to detect when is it on heat. And that correlates to improved conception rate. Lameness detection and general health monitoring to separate and, and treat sick cows. One of the days when you would rely on the guys, Mafuza Mombi, to then detect that this cow is not feeling well. Probably this cow might be suffering from this. But from IoT technology, you'll be able to monitor the cow movement and see that there could be a potential defect, there could be a potential uh, disease that could have affected that animal. And you can be proactive about treating and separating those cows. There's also the aspect of calving detection, so the new calf can be entered into the system and so live birth can be monitored. There is a gadget that can also be tagged on the tail, and you can monitor the tail movements, and it can tell you an hour before it's about to give birth that you need to attend to that calf. How many unsuccessful births of cows that we have, that we have um, uh, encountered. Can you put a value to saving a life? I'm sure this is going to be quite instrumental for us as we can be able to improve the successful birth rate. Most importantly and exciting as well, the GPS location, tracking to monitor the herd. You can be able to tell where the animal is. And most importantly, you can even define a radius to say none of the animals should go beyond this perimeter. In the event that they do, you get an SMS alert that you need to attend to the animal. I'm sure, ladies and gentlemen, this is quite instrumental and it's going to also uh, help us manage stray animals. There's also the integration with farm database <coughs> tracking of any medication or treatments and output from the farm as we capture the data. There's also rumination tracking to see how long they've been eating to monitor health and manage overall head feed ration. Feed ration. Gone are the days where you just send your cattle without having knowledge of whether they are having enough food or whether they are having food in the first place. IoT is going to help us with this. It's also going to help us with identifying animals under heat and cold stress as well. Smart greener. These are some of the very important attributes within the greenhouse which are key for one to monitor. And you can't rely on human beings anymore if you are to be effective and be more productive. Temperature, humidity, leaf wetness, light levels, and oxygen levels. Through the use of IoT sensors, you will be able to monitor the temperature levels. If it has gone below the required temperature, you will see that and you get an alert and you'll be able to intervene and make the necessary temperature adjustments. Not all crops, not all, plant, not all plants would require the same levels of temperature or humidity levels. Now with IoT, this is at, you can, you can now control that uh, from monitoring and with the use of IoT technology. This helps us understanding the variability of the above attributes and to make the necessary adjustments so that we can improve our yield. Let me take this back closer to home. Some of you might be thinking I'm talking of uh, fiction, but
But I'll share with you this video clip in terms of what our colleagues in the African continent have done, and I'm sure Zimbabwe is not an exception. We can follow suit. value that agriculture is delivering to our nation. We have made deliberate strategic focus on agriculture to try to understand how best can we enable the farmers to dominate <coughs> the markets in which they operate in. And it is through identification of the IoT solutions and how best this can improve the yield, how best this can improve the output while we are working with the same resources that we have. Most importantly, 
we are one of the leading connectivity uh, provider in Zimbabwe. I'm sure you can confirm that with the experience that you are currently having on our link. We offer high throughput research technology, which is not the historical VSAT that we know of, but this VSAT can deliver a minimum of 16 Mbps up to 35 Mbps reliable connection, which is very important. We can all talk of these IoT solutions, but they require connectivity. Connectivity is the backbone for these solutions to work. Most importantly, ladies and gentlemen, on the 4th of July, we will be giving a demo at Cresta, demonstrating some of the solutions which I've been talking to. So it's not fiction, it's reality, and it's knocking at our doors. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that uh, presentation, which I think uh, was very well put together and spoke to the real challenges that are being faced. Uh, again, very thought-provoking. I would imagine, as I said, there's a, a need for a holistic look to some of these things because I think the Internet of Things is doing fantastic things and bringing a lot of innovations, but I think there's also the need to change the mindset of the farmers to view agriculture as a business because I may not invest in a smartphone and data and all these other things if I'm not seeing the value for my agriculture. So I think also therein lies uh, another challenge that we need to tackle to make sure that uh, the farmers view agriculture as a business and therefore are willing uh, to invest in it, uh, in these things. But certainly very amazing uh, you know, uh, innovations there and I think that uh, really will be game changers and we look forward to them being rolled out here in Zimbabwe. Uh, let's now uh, put our hands together for our next uh, speaker. Uh, again, I'm sure this will also be very interesting, very technical, and uh, uh, something to look forward to. She is a geospatial specialist at Drone Solutions. Her name is Amanda Chichetu. We put your hands together for her as she comes up to make a presentation. Thank you, to speak on. I just have a few interesting facts. Uh, just a bit of infotainment. Um, just a bit of juxtaposition. Maybe. Um, I read somewhere that um, the Netherlands, a country which is 5% the area of Zimbabwe, earned 6 billion from selling flowers and horticultural products. Israel earned 25 billion in agricultural products in the last year. They are only 10% of the area of Zimbabwe. The GDP of Zimbabwe is 17 billion, give or take. So only in agriculture, Israel will surpass us, a country 10% of our area. So we're getting it wrong somewhere, and these people are getting it right somewhere. Uh, they are embracing technology in such, in such a way that it... So uh, we have that from our previous speakers. Uh, we are all about smart agriculture and precision farming. I mean, these terms might seem really, really big at the moment, but at its core, precision farming is really merely site-specific crop management. So what are we talking about? So we're saying I've got a 100 hectare farm, and I want to 
plant-based remains, and then one portion, maybe just two hectares, is underwater stress. What do I do if I don't know which two hectares is underwater stress? I flood the whole thing with water. The part that was underwater stress, okay, fine, I'll start improving. But what about the 98 hectares that was not experiencing water stress? It's now being overwatered, which will have adverse effect to the plant. So the entire field has been ruined because of two hectares. So we're talking about site specific. I want to know exactly which two hectares are underwater stress and which other two hectares are maybe in need fertilizer. And how do I do this? It's 100 hectares. Do I walk the entire 100 hectares? That is really, really difficult to do. So that's why we come with drones. So due to their ability to mount various sensors on these drones, they have uh, become a major tool really in providing actionable intelligence for, for precision farming. The multispectral scanners mounted on these drones are able to measure reflectance of crops in various spectral bands. So these reflectances are then used to infer information and uh, intelligence about the health of the crops and develop what we're calling uh, crop health maps. So these maps, they show crop health through colors. Uh, for example, that. So it will show the healthiest as being green, and then we'll move through the bar, and then the less healthy will become red. So that's an example of a crop health map. Maybe we have another one somewhere. And that's another example. So what are we saying? We're saying the most common of these vegetation indices is what we call the normalized different vegetation index. So this index is used to measure photosynthetic activity in the crops. So we are all saying that, uh, like from my very basic knowledge of uh, agriculture, we're saying photosynthesis, that's where the food is made, and it's all about the green, right? So we're saying photosynthetic activity in the plants is what we measure using the NDVI, and which we can then use to infer how healthy is the crop, and how much will it truly produce based on how green it is, and how the, uh, the level of photosynthetic activity in the plants. But we also have other vegetation indices that we are developing and some that are already being used. For example, we have the normalized difference red edge index. This is derived from a red edge scanner. So this red edge sensor will actually detect the reflectance of the crops in the red edge uh, <coughs> spectrum, uh, the red edge band of the electromagnetic spectrum. So once we have that, we can use it to infer uh, information about the measure of uptake of ions in the roots. So how much ions are being uptake by the, by the roots? Which will tell us actually how the health is this crop. And then we also have the CWSI. This is the crop water stress index. Uh, this one will be able to tell you, is this crop under water stress or is it healthy? Or is the reflectance what we would expect for a healthy crop? If it's not, you know where to irrigate and you know where not to. So that you, you don't risk damaging healthy crops of a few and not the ones. We also have another one called uh, SAMI. This is basically an NDVI which has been adjusted for soil reflectance. So we're saying we're measuring the reflectance of these crops. But if your soil is also highly reflective, that means you might get poor readings or your readings might be confused with that of the plant getting confused with that of the soil. So this one is adjusting it for the reflectance of the soil so that your data is more accurate. There are also other type of information that you can infer from using these sensors. Uh, for example, the moisture levels in the soil, etc., as well as the iron levels in the soil, and all that. You can get that using drones. Isn't that amazing? I mean, you can fly a 100 hectare farm in 20 minutes, and you can then have all this information. But type of thing, are really. So those are other examples of the NDVI maps. But we're saying drone technology is moving really quickly. So, I mean, last year, at the beginning of last year, we are talking about the, poti the possibility of getting a drone that sprays. And boom, this year we've got the adverse energy. This drone is incredible, really. It's used to apply no pesticides and liquid fertilizers to crops. It's, it does this very fast. It can fly up to 10 hectares in an hour, and it carries 10, liquid, 10 liters of the pesticide. So you're spraying your crops at up to 60 times faster than you would do it with a backpack. So yeah, we're moving quickly. And uh, you need to jump on the train because this is where the future is. So spraying with drones is not just about being fast. It's also about being safe. So you don't want to be exposing your personnel to these harmful chemicals more than necessary. 
to the drone, you're minimizing the human handling of chemicals. So that's an example of the DJI Agra Center. Like, it's beautiful, isn't it? <laughs> it's an octocopter, and yeah, that's the tank down there. It carries 10 liters of fuel. It's amazing. It's a beautiful piece of equipment. And I advise those with really big farms to invest in this thing. Okay, and the drones, they're now carrying lighter sensors, and uh, they're now also carrying thermal sensors. So with thermal and lighter sensors, you can use this for analysis of moisture levels in the soils and analysis of drainage patterns in the, uh, of the terrain. So you need all this information. If you're going to design an irrigation script, you need to know the drainage pattern. If you're going to be applying fertilizers, you need to know the drainage pattern of this. So these sensors, they might still be quite expensive at the moment, but at the rate at which the technology is moving, soon enough they will be commonplace but their capacity to add value is undeniable. We need to invest in this thing. Like I say, we need to start move, looking at agriculture as more than just a, a way of feeding your family, your immediate or maybe your extended family, and look at it as a business. Invest in it so that we get more returns. And as drone solutions, we are trying to just give this country and uh, Africa in the future a leg up, you know, just help them understand these technologies and how they are useful to them. So drone solutions you can, I mean, why do you adopt drone technology? Like we've covered that. It's efficient and it's effective. You're doing more with less and in a very short space of time. And it's safer and the data is very comparable. I mean, these are just maps. You can view them on your phone, on your machine, and you're getting this information that is very much actionable. So it's not useless. And then surveillance. So uh, that's a, something that we haven't covered here, but it's a real thing. You need to actually monitor your farm. You need to monitor your farm workers. You need to monitor uh, for encroachment. So drones are also useful for surveillance. So where can you find drone solutions? Right there, number nine golfers drones uh, in Arabia. If you want to come through and see some of these drones we're talking about, or maybe discuss the possibility of getting some of these services for yourself. Please go on and do quite a bit. Thank you very much. Once again, thank you so much for that presentation. Um, let me now quickly call upon uh, uh, lecturer and founder of Kugona Kulima Agricultural Consultants. Uh, you can uh, listen to him here on ZFM's show, the XL blog. Uh, very regularly. His name is Mr. Mike Kopp. He's put your hands together for you to come up uh, for the final presentation before we get into our panel discussion. Okay, please come up. And uh, as a true farmer, he doesn't have all the frills and drills. He's just going to be Great. No presentation, no PowerPoint. He's a, he's a, a proper farmer. Over to you, man. <laughs> stage of the year when we've run out of um, grazing and we now have to feed the animals. I'm a production economist and my theory of reality is every hectare that we farm, whether it's livestock or crops, has to be productive. It has to be productive. And in order to understand that, um, I take a step backwards and I say, Having listened to this technology that's prevailing now, there's a tremendous amount of information which the farmer can benefit by and he can benefit from. But in my capacity um, as the uh, consultant of Kukona Kurima, the first
first thing I notice when people come and talk to me is their total lack of knowledge of agricultural potential in terms of what the farm can offer. And here I'm particularly concerned about soil. Soil classification, land classification, land use, to put those three ingredients together to make a productive farm. This is so absolutely essential. I'm consulting right now for a doctor, him and his wife, both medical practitioners. They have no idea of how to farm. I've got them on a special program. It's classified at the moment because in one year I turn around for them $135,000 gross profit. They didn't know it was possible. And it's not, um, it's not the standard farming practices that we know. It's something special. Um, I've taken it upon myself to make information available to farmers. Um, I should have brought it with me today, but it's in the process of being edited, and I've got it at home. I've written 15 handbooks for farmers. The one is Money Matters. The one that I'm publishing in about a month's time is called Money Matters for Small-Scale Farmers. It's absolutely essential that they know how to invest their money. Because there's nothing worse in a business if you invest money and it bleeds out of the system. And when I say it bleeds out of the system, it's not generating, it's not creating a turnover. Simply because of a lack of knowledge of the farmer on how to use the resources available um, to him. I speak to farmers. And the first thing he says to me is, what can I grow here? And I pretend I'm a doctor. I said, there's something wrong here. Tell me. What is the pH of the soil? Oh, strong words. Hydrogen ion concentration of the soil. He doesn't even understand what I'm talking about. But I have to know the pH. And the other day I asked the farmer to have his soil analyzed. 3.6. I said, that's going to take five years to recover that um, to a pH very close to seven. I said, you can do nothing with it. That soil had implo imploded, no structure, low pH, compaction. It had all the worst components. How can you recommend that a farmer must grow a crop on um, soil conditions like that? Sadly, the reality of it is, this is what prevails. I am so glad that all this technology is available. Because the farmer <coughs> can't blame technology, he can only point a finger at himself. I say on the radio program here, I say to farmers, listen, in order to be successful, you have to be knowledgeable. And in order to be knowledgeable, you have to understand the limitations of farming. Take the cropping uh, <coughs> programs, for example. Land use. Land classification, soil classification, how deep that soil is, how can I utilize that soil, percentage crop and rotation to avoid the SLEMSA equation going out the window. These are frightening realities where there is, and I say so respectfully because <clears throat> I think farmers are not getting sufficient information at grassroots level, use a pun. They are ignorant of the criteria of land use. They phone me here and ask for attention. Is there anybody from Agritex here? I have the greatest respect for Agritex and for what they were <coughs> set out to do, but I never see them. <laughs> I don't even see them at a meeting like this today which is absolutely, vitally important that they should be here. Our concerns, everyone sitting around here, and blend together. And I would like to create a situation where we can say, we have reverted to agriculture as it was in this country, the breadbasket of Africa. And I'll step out of my zone completely and say, yes, 
we can achieve that again. And we will achieve it. It is part of a driving force for this political system. This political system cannot ignore the fact that it is driven by mining and agriculture. I've heard statistics here this morning about a potential growth in agriculture over the next two years. I'm interested. My big question is, <clears throat> will that be achieved? And in theory, it should be achieved. We've got all the ingredients in this country to make it work. And I'll be the first to lend support there. Because I say, Kurima, <laughs> where money grows. And that's important about being a production economist. You must look at it in terms of investment. And <clears throat> the three volumes which I've compressed into one document called Money Matters for Small Scale Farmers. <clears throat> um, I'm currently doing the final editing. It should be available soon. I'm suggesting that if you see it, buy two copies. One you keep nicely stashed in your cupboard, and the other one you make as a working document, because I've written it for farmers to show them the difference between a budget, a cash flow, and a balance sheet. <laughs> and to make them understand um, the differences, because it's extremely difficult to read a balance sheet. And I'm wondering how many people here can confidently put their hands in the air and say, yes, I can read a balance sheet. Because a balance sheet is a, a reflection of what happened on the farm. If I look at my assets, and I look at my liabilities, I combine the two a little bit of money, I can see the profitability of the business. The greater the profits, the more successful the business. The more successful the business, the more competent the farmer. And this is what I'm saying. And it's that competency, that competency that we'd like to hone in on. Make it more competent. Make it more efficient. Make it more productive. No, I can remember when I was growing up um, in this country, I was born here, I was bred here. My grandfather was the first white man born in this country. My father was born in this country. I was born in this country. So I've seen the development, every aspect of this development. I can remember on the railway lines in this country, Grain um, Marketing Board used to have maize dumps, all the maize, they couldn't store it in town. They couldn't store it anywhere except on the railway sidings. Mountains of maize covered in, 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 in thick canvas. Mountains of this stuff. Now if you look for a bucket of maize, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it becomes a problem. <laughs> it doesn't just end with maize. I'm extremely interested, thank you, I'm extremely interested in the horticultural crops as well because they provide us with instant food, okay? It grows from our backyard to extensive areas and that is important. And when I say extensive areas, um, <coughs> every farmer, every, every household in this country indulges in some form of agriculture. And I'll say that on the radio. And the one day I was talking about domestic agriculture and the potatoes and tomatoes and the carrots that were grown in the ground. Man, that phone didn't stop ringing next door. They want to know how to do it properly. They want to know how to do it properly. And this is so encouraging that there is a thirst and desire out there to improve the quality of um, productivity. I think, and I hope I'm talking sense here by saying we can harness that again can be done. I have one objection to the political system and how it's handling the land issue. And in order to be realistic about this, I have to be um, um, <coughs> touch on sensitive issue. I have to touch on sensitive issue. I think the land distribution, as it happened um, in 1980 or thereabouts, when it did start happening, um, was probably the correct thing should have happened in this country. 
because the intellectual base of this country has climbed down an enormous ladder. And there was feedback to the farmer. But the method in which it was done was totally incorrect. And when you look at the land redistribution, as has happened again today, it's taken viability out of land. And it has said, we can give you, we lend you the land for 99 years. If I inherit a piece of land for 99 years, I tell you what, I'm going to farm it to the pH where it's irrecoverable. I'll push it right down to one. <laughs> the truth of it is, if farmers are also given the responsibility of ownership, there is nothing more motivating in this world. And motivation comes from within. What belongs to me is mine. That little bit of land has got to be productive. That is a sensitive issue. If there are politicians here who are listening, please, take it from me. I'm just an individual opening and closing my mouth. But the reality of it is the land issue has failed us and failed our farmers. But I'm sure, once again, we can recover. Um, somebody must be timing me. <laughs> they said, 10 minutes, 10 minutes. And I get to 10 minutes so quickly. Um, but what I'd like to do now is just summarize for you, summarize the issues. Fortunately, I have taught at Ruby College. I was principal at Blackford the Agricultural College. I lectured at the university um, in agriculture. <clears throat> so um, there's a certain amount of academic experience there as well. And in summary, I'd like to say that if we harness if we harness the resources of agriculture correctly and we do what is told we are capable of doing here, that would be an incredible step in the right direction. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Mike. I'll just ask you to take a seat and I'll also ask all our other presenters to come up to the front here so we can get a quick question and answer session. Uh, when you were speaking, I was uh, reminded of uh, my brief short lived to 4, 4 a.m. into farming, uh, where I was a quintessential cell phone farmer. I uh, tried to grow tobacco in uh, Yabira, but uh, I didn't uh, care much or know much about uh, cash flows and balance sheets. I was just interested in the drive over the weekend. And, uh, you know, the drives out there. But thank you so much for that. And I think it, it really gets us into, uh, you know, the, the, the sort of questions that I think we ought to be asking. Um, you you talk about the need to, for, for farming to be more efficient, to be more productive. Thankfully, I think uh, farmers now, uh, Zimbabwe now, Africa now is in a very fortunate position where there is all this information that is available and literally at their fingertips via their mobile phones via so many gadgets and, you know, some of the presentations that we've heard speak to that. Uh, so I think, you know, what is the question then is how to make sure that the farmers who ought to be getting this information, who ought to be using this and applying this technology, actually do it. Is it a matter of resourcing them? Is it a matter of, uh, you know, you spoke about agritechs, which is meant to be, uh, you know, that sort of conduit. Do we use that? How best do we get the information that these farmers need in at their fingertips for them to use? And what more is it that they need? Um, I spoke earlier that I think there's need for farmers to actually appreciate farming as a business. And, and I think he spoke to that as well. So uh, I'll just get the ball rolling by asking that question to say, we've got the internet of things, which my brother spoke about. We've got drones that can work a charm and, and can be useful. How do we get that to the farmers? Is it accessible? How do we make it accessible? How do we make them want to use it and therefore be able to actually then uh, derive the benefits that they ought to be? Um, people who are watching us uh, on, online, please get in touch. Please ask questions. Please comment and contribute. Uh, the audience that is here, you can also participate. Uh, a microphone is available for you to ask your questions. This session actually now belongs to us. We've heard them make their presentations. I think it's now time for us to interact and engage with them. So I don't know if anyone would like to just, uh, perhaps I'll, I'll begin with you, Mike, very briefly. How do we get these farmers to, to use these resources that are fortunately available to them? Uh, 
Thank you very much. Um, you know, I look around Africa and I see success stories, I see failures. And I look at um, the situation in Kenya, where Kenya went through the doldrums of agriculture and they thought it was irrecoverable. Kenya then established what they called the cell farming system, where they had one commercial farmer and he was responsible for about 10 or 15 smaller uh, commercial farmers around him. And those commercial farmers who were reliant on the small commercial farmers, who were reliant on the large commercial farmer, had to do what the commercial farmer did and told them to do at the specific time for the specific reason, etc. Kenya is now a leader in agriculture in Africa. It is it has surpassed all expectation simply because it went to the individual route and said, you guys are now responsible for the farmers around you. That system can work. And when I said earlier, I was concerned about uh, the distribution of land in this country, my original idea was cell farming, where you have one commercial farmer responsible for about uh, 15 or 20 <coughs> farmers around him small scale, reduced in quantity, but to make it work. Alas, we didn't have an opportunity to express ourselves. That's how I replied to that. Let me just hand over to Ignatius and Samuel, because he had a very you know, gripping presentation on, 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 the, on the internet of things. And, and, and I think you know, those tools that you speak about, you know, they are game changers. They all make a huge difference. But how accessible are they to, to, to our farmers? Who, you know, how do we get it out there for them to be able to use? Okay, thank you very much. Yes, definitely they are accessible. I think of late there's been something that we, we hear of, we read of, uh, and we see on the, on the internet. But uh, in Stanley Mtande, we have partnered uh, some, uh, some colleagues who we are working with to then provide these solutions. And like I said, on the 4th of July, we'll be doing a demo of these solutions uh, at Cresta. So definitely, yes, they are available. And uh, Stanley Mtande will also be engaging farmers uh, at group levels or at their associations, at association level or their meetings to tell them about these solutions and how best they can be able to employ them and uh, get them to get them to use them. So yes, definitely the access. Thank you. Um, any, uh, in the audience, if you'd like to just comment and contribute, please do so. I, I just want to talk about, again, the issue of uh, extension services you spoke about agritex a lot as well. I think, you know, one of the things there that certainly my own observation, speaking to some farmers, is also the fact that a lot of the extension officers that are coming in to provide these services are perhaps uh, college graduates, university graduates themselves who may not have uh, experience in the coal face, who may not, uh, you know, the information you spoke about, knowing the pH of the soil, knowing what should be grown here, is very different when it's theoretical and practical. So again, I'll put it to the panel, uh, perhaps also to you, Madam. In terms of, uh, there's a lot of theory, a lot of uh, this technological stuff may give you theoretical content. So my application may tell me, uh, you know, this time of the year in this region, expect this percentage of rainfall, and this is what you can grow. But the reality on the ground may not necessarily be that. How do we ensure that it's not just theoretical and technical? That what we what is being dispensed is applicable and will actually work on the ground. Anyone who would like to just chip in on that as well and just share some experiences, drone technologies, before we give to more than one. Um, okay. uh, the question posed was that um, how do we make the technology not be something theoretical mm -hmm. from what I understood? And how do you make it something practical? Well, um, oh, it's yeah, there are a lot of innovations which you'll hear in theory, but when you try to get to the core base, you try to apply it now, uh, things are much uh, substantially different. So perhaps um, what we need to do is that um, we, we need to embrace, um, what can I say? Oh, actually, I would I would allow the gentleman to <laughs> <laughs> formulate my thoughts more properly. All right, thank you very much. I think uh, in trying to answer your question, uh, how do we make these uh, technologies not just theoretical, 
you find that of late years it has always been an algorithm which says if this, then that. But we have gone past that stage where we now have data analytics in terms of these machines being able to collect the information on the ground, being able to, uh, to go through what we call machine learning and adaptive, uh, adaptive learning such that it's no longer a matter of what has been coded in the actual gadget to say if this, then it means that. So you find that it's the machine learns that we only received rains in November instead of probably September. It would then use that information for future uh, decision making. Thank you very much. So um, in, in light of this question, as drone solutions, what we've done to try and make uh, these, and specifically the services we provide, to be less of a theoretical thing and more of a practical thing is, we tried to partner with the bigger uh, actors in agriculture in Zimbabwe, like uh, CIPO and Aya, to try and uh, test out these uh, services before we bring them out to the farmers. So we have tested things like um, appropriate farms, um, appropriate maps, and my indices, their applicability. We have tested them out with uh, partners like CIPO, and uh, we find that the theoretical to the practical is working. And if all these technologies can maybe be tested out a little bit before they are given out to the farmers for mass use, maybe that will assist in getting this from theoretical to practical in a more, I don't know, workable way. All right, um, yeah. If I might uh, just add. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, so what my colleague Amanda is describing is a process we call ground truth. So um, what you are doing with ground truthing, for example, if you are dealing with now crop health, right? Um, you are looking at your, you trial this, you see, on the ground. You are dealing with a crop you know, that perhaps you go to a one hectare plot of maize you are familiar with. And you know that this corner is more viable, this one less so. So you fly your drone and you compare the data you get from your drone. So, once you're now doing this on a larger scale, you, can, you have now truthed your data, you see, for statistical accuracy, of course. And you're also going to calibrate your sensor so that the radiometry, the readings you get are appropriate with the, um, with the, with the conditions you meet in the environment. So this might be issues like sunlight and so on and so forth. So, of course, you're going to trial your data, truth them, right? Yes, is the way to put it. Absolutely. Very okay, right. Can I contribute? Yes, please. Maybe to the question which was raised by Mr. Cobb, he said there was a, there is a possibility of grouping the farm the farmers under the farm. Don't you think that if they do so, maybe maybe there is a possibility of you people who are selling drones, maybe put some of the drones to be borrowed at a certain time because. We don't need the, the drone for the whole year. We will help a lot of people because they'll be coming, maybe borrowing, renting, they'll pay money, and then they continue. I think it is also the whole country. Thank you. Uh, if I may just address that. Uh, as drone solutions, we are already doing that. We have a setup where we hire out our drones to farmers who only need them for one time use, and we also have a setup where we come in and we provide the service some of those things are more technical and as a farmer you might not want to learn this whole thing from ground from zero to hero mm -hmm. so we're there for you we already know the things and we can help you out get your start then there's no awareness you have to do something on the radio so that they know that there is this facility then keeping quiet people Thank that you. know <laughs> that last point speaks to uh, via twitter one of the uh, uh, people following this discussion, Shana Chitinde speaks exactly to that point. It says, innovations being suggested are actually in existence. The real gap is linking the people, developing the apps, uh, doing these things such as hydroponics to go and uh, smart farming onto platforms where they are able to then speak to, to the wider population, so radio and TV. So uh, these amazing, fantastic things are being created and generated, but perhaps not getting to the audience and the people that they ought to be getting. I thought about it uh, when... Uh, uh, the GM of Utande was talking about uh, a presentation at uh, Cresta Lodge, and I thought how many farmers would be able to get there, but he then did say that through farmers groups, they will be engaging. So uh, certainly we look forward to that. Uh, keep contributions coming through via Twitter. I'd like to ask uh, Mike very quickly, uh, uh, 
yeah, as we take notes, yeah. Uh, this Jeremy, he's already got the mic? Yeah. Oh, okay, go ahead. From online. All right, online. Okay, um, the question is coming from on Twitter from Jason1. Okay, he's got, a, he's got a lot of numbers next to his name. Uh, he says uh, cost is a factor when uh, trying to access some of the technology that has been spoken about. Uh, what, does, what solutions uh, do the, does the panel have uh, for farmers that may not necessarily have uh, the, the money to, uh, to, to hire out the equipment that has uh, been talked about? Thank you so much. Uh, I think there's another question there. Okay. Uh, good morning. Um, I'm from the Nyazura area. I happen to be in the city now because things have not been working out for us as farmers. So I wanted to ask the guys from uh, Drone Solutions. Two years ago, I actually lost a cow, which uh, I had bought for so much, you know? And um, I wanted to ask how practical it is for us to get the technology in our area, number one. Number two, I also wanted to mention the aspect of number one, the um, it's a it's a workshop at the Cresta. The farmers themselves, I'm not really sure if they'll be able to come through. I come from that area, and you know God has blessed me to be exposed, but not as many farmers. I think I represent one percent of the people that are actually on the ground. So I think there there needs to be a, a very direct link from the service provider to the farmer because it sounds so good right now. But I'm only wishing that the people that need this information and uh, would be helped by this sort of information are not getting it. So I don't know what plans can be formulated uh, for you guys to be able to reach us where we are. Thank you. Uh, before they come through on that, just another question I'd like to put uh, to everyone, but I, I know Mike then touched on it. We are already in the situation where there are farmers who don't have the knowledge, who are on soils that they shouldn't be growing, they shouldn't be farming because of different things. How do we then fix that problem given that we're already in it? We've got people who uh, are essentially subsistence farmers, occupying farms, and as long as they are farming for subsistence, uh, you know, we'll never achieve the, 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 the quantum leap that we need to in terms of food production. So we are already in this scenario, how best do we uh, rectify it or address it? So those are the questions over to you, I think, uh, and we'll, we'll answer all three that have come through. I'm trying to um, think along these lines in answering that question. Um, if the, the resources are inaccessible because of deterioration, one can always redirect the farmer and say to him, look, why don't you think of an option that you working on the soil, like, for example, livestock? There's a tremendous amount that one can do with livestock, intensive livestock, going from pigs, poultry, egg production, anything where you can import your uh, food and the resources that you require. Um, redirecting a farmer is a tremendous benefit, A, for the consultant, and B, for the farmer himself, because he realizes I don't just have to farm the soil, and that there are other aspects to farming. And I go from on traditional annual crops to perennial crops, um, even to um, uh, crops like uh, fruit, uh, oranges, peaches, apples, anything like that, redirect their thought from what they're doing because they might be um, thinking incorrectly. It's quite easy if you've got access um, to the information. And by the sounds of it, um, on my left here, we've got access to anything we want in this country. We're just not using it efficiently. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I think I'll speak to the question on affordability of this technology. So what people are failing to understand is that as much as this technology is expensive, you don't have to go it alone. For example, like you're saying that you can have many small scale farmers grouped under the supervision of one big farmer. So you can, these people can partner in the purchase of, uh, for example, the DJI uh, Agris MD for spray, they can partner. This thing sprays 10 hectares in an hour. So I'm sure if five or six farmers partner and purchase one, they can all use it. So you don't have to do it a lot. It takes a village, right? <laughs> for me, what I see is the problem is because you are not partnering with the Minister of Agriculture, because you are talking about the farmers, and the farmers are in the village, 
when he held the, the meeting at Crystal Hall, <laughs> 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 then I even attend. I think maybe we are directing our efforts in the wrong place. If we involve in of agriculture, then you can arrange the, the event maybe in those villages. In the year, this it is a good, a good, good news for to them. They will buy the, the technology. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think I'll start with the uh, uh, issue of cost, like she has highlighted. That generally you find that the IoT solutions has been made for the big commercial farmers, but it has come to the realize we've come to a point where we realize that even the young farmers also need these solutions. And some of um, some of the steps that we have taken is to sit down with the partners and understand the different scopes different scenario analysis because the way how these IT solutions are applied in Australia or any other regions is different with the how they will be applied in Zimbabwe. So these are baby steps to try and make it more applicable within the Zim context. So obviously there's going to be a process of scoping, trying to uh, do some scenario analysis in terms of, okay, this is what is prevailing within Zim. How best can we uh, make this affordable to the farmers in, in, in Zimbabwe? and to also include working with the ministry as well and any other, uh, any other partners. In terms of interaction, sorry, I, I, I see that the, the crest uh, <laughs> issue still comes, it's coming up. <laughs> this, is the, this is the launch, this is the start. But maybe just to put things into perspective, as Daniel Tande, we recently partnered and signed MOUs with the Commercial Farmers Union. We have also done the same with the Federation of Young Farmers Commercial Union, and we've also done some monthly meetings with the Beatrice Farmers uh, to begin with. So we are going in the right direction of engaging the farmers in areas where they interact, in these associations where they belong to, such that we can have a way of <coughs> disseminating this information through the monthly meetings, through the newsletters which they receive on, 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 on a monthly basis, and we are even we have even started attending to the um, field days which the farmers do conduct. So we believe through those means we'll be able to disseminate this information and also get feedback from the actual farmers in terms of how we can customize the solution to work better for them. Thank you very much. Um, okay, yeah. Uh, everyone is big on cost this morning, uh, as they should, right? Um, well, we can approach the whole cost issue differently. Um, well, it's not the most prudent thing for for one individual farmer in Zimbabwe to purchase a drone, because farming is structured differently in Zimbabwe, if you look at it. In the West, farming is a much mechanized industry. In Zimbabwe, it's more a labor-intensive industry. So what would be best suitable to uh, medium scale farmers in Zimbabwe would be to hire out a drone, for example. Um, and then, of course, there are other ways to deal with it. If you want to get remote sensed information about your crops, water stress, health, you can compromise a bit on the quality and use satellite imagery, but the costs fall significantly. We can also supply you with that. So, there are other ways of working around those costs. Um, and then, of so, so that's a lower, lower end solution, which is technological in that regard. Uh, and then of course, well, drones are quite versatile. There was the question posed as to how practical is it in our areas, of course. So in areas where there might be high risk of using technology, again, hiring would be best for you because uh, the costs are on the what? On the supply of the service. So there's that. Um, but you can purchase, they are quite versatile as a technology. Um, and then of course in terms of outreach, what we've done is that we've tried to reach out to farmers, uh, uh, industrial marketing boards such as the TIMB and sales floors so that they can redirect us to farmers who are larger producers. Yeah. And then of course once we reach out to the producers who are large, they may in turn refer us to the smaller farmers surrounding them in a quasi-cell system, of course, as I can describe it. Um, right, thank you very much. I think uh, some insights certainly uh, and points coming through that uh, I think all these should be presented to, or, you know, I think a lot more engagement with the Ministry of Agriculture. I think that that is, for me, one of the key takeaways because I think 
in my personal opinion, gone are the days where we should be uh, assisting and supporting farmers by giving them grain and fertilizer. Those should be things that a farmer should be doing anyway, rather, uh, you know, put in place a, a district drone system or something like that, as opposed to giving them, uh, you know, seed and, and fertilizer, which they should, if they are worth any worth their salt, be able to do anyway. Uh, redirecting farmers, I think, will become very pertinent. Mike, I foresee the potential. Uh, this whole tobacco bubble bursting, where eventually tobacco farmers, everyone who said they want to grow tobacco, will A, perhaps not have the returns that they need to, or as we move towards uh, this whole anti-smoking uh, trajectory globally, uh, tobacco farming may be unviable. So I think those farmers need to start being redirected and, and looking at other alternatives and perhaps using what they're earning now to invest in other, in other crops and, and other uh, lines. Um, if there are any other questions or contributions, uh, if none, I think we say, okay, go ahead. There, there's uh, one. Thank you very much. Um, millennials. <laughs> Please, I want you to use this term. Millennials, we have a very difficult task at hand of telling baby boomers that there's other tech. I'm telling you this. Um, it's, a, it's fortunate that I'm an MIP student and I've discovered that in uh, my path to learning intellectual property, people don't even know what it is. So I sit down for a good 30 minutes and talk about IP to a random person. So now here we are talking about agri-tech. How am I going to explain to my father that there's a drone, there's a, there's a smart farming? I don't know. I, I really don't know. So we as millennials, we have a big task at hand. And please, people who are investing in smart farming and you guys responsible for drone tech, don't leave out the small farmers, these this guys. Just like how the SMEs are accommodated in patterns where they talk of utility models, they're quite helpful. Because the SMEs are responsible for building the economy. These small farmers, just like what this guy said, they're the ones going to be responsible to build up on the economy and restore our glorious bread basket of Africa. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you so much. I think that's a, a very good point. So I wish to end the formal part of this discussion, but I know we'll continue to engage and ask questions after this. You're most welcome to network, which is a very important part of uh, uh, of this uh, of this event, which is why we bring you together, networking, sharing contacts. I'm sure uh, people want to know where to buy copies of that book. People will want invitations to the July 4th function. Uh, you know, we may want lessons on how to you know to to, to fly drones and also uh, understand a bit more about uh, intellectual property and how I can work about protecting my ideas. So thank you so much to our panelists. Uh, please give them a huge round of applause. And <laughs> um, I would like to thank everyone who is here and everyone who participated and uh, uh, asked questions, followed us online. Very important that uh, you know we engage with you, we participate. Would love to hear back from you in terms of how we can make these events bigger and better and more relevant and pertinent. I'm sure this agricultural will require some sort of follow-up uh, in a more agricultural setting, I would imagine, away from uh, the city. But uh, we want to thank you all for being a part of this, uh, to our sponsors for supporting this, for helping us make it a reality. Thank you so much. We are hugely indebted to you. We are very grateful and we look forward to your continued support going forward. This um, ends the formal part of the proceedings, but as I said, uh, you know, there's a lot of networking opportunity to interact and interface. Or I think you want to say something? Yes, um, <clears throat> just as we close up again, thank you so much. Um, I would also like to say thank you very much to our moderator. Um, Mr. Farai Mabutuya is, uh, honestly, his reputation precedes him. Uh, yes, it does. <laughs> his reputation precedes him. Uh, he's one of the uh, most brilliant journalistic minds uh, to have been produced out of Zimbabwe. Um, and um, he is leading several conversations, not just here in front of us, but also online. Please follow him, FM Pointman, on uh, Twitter, and keep up to date with the incredible work that he's been doing. He is, I like to call, a, I think, a, a ZFM alumni. Um, so he's family for us. <laughs> and so it's so wonderful to have support from 
uh, family, and I think he's done an incredible job today. So please, if we could give uh, Farai a very warm round of applause. Um, Afri Digital, we have these lectures. Uh, we try to do them every month uh, or every so often. Um, our next uh, few lectures, we're focusing on communication, mining, uh, environment, so that's your green tech, uh, and a few others, including the creative economy. So please watch our social media platforms, so that's Facebook and Twitter, for the full calendar that we're going to release. We're gonna release the next three lectures so that you know in advance if you see something of interest to you. We're also moving um, as to address a point that was raised, I forgot who raised it, about having it on more, getting this information out there. We understand that obviously as an event, not everyone can come to the, to the event, not everyone can live stream. We are also going on radio. Um, so within the next two weeks, we will be on, Afri Digital will be on radio every Monday evening from quarter past seven uh, until quarter to eight. So that's every Monday evening, uh, starting in the next two weeks, Afri Digital, and we'll be having these conversations on radio. We will bring in um, the same uh, guests and new guests as well, where we'll deep dive into the issues around how the fourth industrial revolution has impacted and is impacting our African economies. So thank you so much to our speakers, and thank you again to Farai and for everyone who's here. First, the world is becoming more prosperous. Over 1 billion people have been lifted out of poverty in the last 20 years. Three factors. The factor of technology, the factor of norms, that is, legislation, and also society. We know a lot about the biotechnologies, about the nanotechnologies. We know uh, a lot about the human genome. And of course, uh, we need to take into account the media power that would definitely stand behind the behavior of the society. In the role of communication in organizing the masses. de la conciencia social acerca de la protección del medio ambiente. Artificial intelligence, taking massive amounts of time and money out of the manufacturing process, these are things that will dramatically improve society.